Hi, I'm Mohammad Sadri, and this is part two of uh, session seven of our zinc training video, and it's called Creating Custom Axoid Master Peripherals. And in the first session, we talked about the theory of uh, this story a little bit, and now we are going to enter the practical part and to see um, how we can really implement and realize the logic that we want on the zinc device. So a very quick overview of what we had previously is this block diagram. The basic idea is to create a very simple image rotator as a hardware accelerator. And our image rotator is responsible for reading an image from the DRAM memory, which is connected to the Zinc PS, performing a very basic image rotation operation, and then writing back the result again to the DRAM memory. So our hardware accelerator has two interfaces, one Axi slave interface, one Axi master interface. Both of these interfaces are memory mapped interfaces, the Axi slave interface I use for configuration through this interface. The CPU, in fact, can configure our hardware accelerator. And the Axi master interface I use for grabbing the data from the DRAM and writing back the data to the DRAM. Obviously, here we need to have access to different locations in the DRAM memory. Here, I'm showing you the symbolic representation of our hardware accelerator after it is ready. So after we developed the required RTL for our hardware accelerator and we packaged the RTL into an IP, we will have this representation. Our IP will have an Axi master interface, an Axi slave interface, an interrupt port, and a set of clocks and resets. And then we are going to use this piece of IP in an example zinc design. So here is our IP block. And this is a very simple example design in which this IP block can operate. We have our image rotator IP through an Axi interconnect. It's connected to the zinc PS through the HP0 port of the zinc PS. And then, through the GP0 port of the Zinc, we can get connected to the Axi slave interface of our IP block, and we can configure the IP block uh, to give it the required, in fact, configuration information, and then to start rotation tasks. Furthermore, our IP block has an interrupt port, and the interrupt port is coming again to the interrupt input of the Zinc PS. So we will describe how we create this block diagram in further detail later. I wanted just to show you how it will look like after we created our IP. So what kind of information are going to be transferred from the CPU to our image rotator through the Axi slave interface? In fact, when our image rotator wants to operate, it needs two physical addresses on the DRAM memory. The first physical address is the address from which it should read the input image. The second one is the address to which it should write the output image. And then we, the CPU, the ARM host, should also give our hardware accelerator the type of task that it should do our hardware accelerator will be able to perform just simple copy operations, just to copy the input image to the output image. Or it will be able to perform flip operations, flip vertical or horizontal operations on the input image. Or it will be able to perform rotate operations, rotate 90 degree, clockwise, or counterclockwise. So these are the set of operations that we will implement into our hardware accelerator. And the CPU, every time that it wants to use our hardware accelerator, needs to indicate to our hardware accelerator which type of operation it should do. 
then the CPU is responsible for starting the hardware acceleration task. So whenever the CPU commands to our hardware accelerator now a start, the hardware accelerator will begin reading the image, performing the rotation, and writing the result back. And then finally, the CPU should define for the hardware accelerator the size of the image on which it should operate. So in addition to the input output addresses, it should also indicate what is the size of the image on which our hardware accelerator should perform its processing task. And then, our hardware accelerator will send the CPU only practically one signal. And that signal is an interrupt. And that is an indicative of the rotation task being finished. So whenever the hardware accelerator finishes a rotation task, it will send an interrupt to the CPU to inform him that the rotation task is done and the data is ready in the output image buffer. So here is how I define uh, the register map required for transferring the configuration information from the CPU to the hardware accelerator. As I told you, I use the Axi slave interface of my hardware accelerator to transfer this data from the CPU to the hardware accelerator. And in the XI slave interface, I implement these registers. And I put each of these registers in a specific address. And the CPU, by writing to that specific address, will be able to define the different configuration parameters which are needed by the hardware accelerator. For the Axi master part, we are going to use uh, one of the IP blocks of the Xilinx, which is Axi master burst, IPIF. This is a simplified block diagram of an Axi master burst IPIF. As you see, in one side, the Axi master best IPIF will be connected to the Axi world. So on one side, this block talks Axi. On the other side, this block should talk to the logic that I develop. So on this side, this IP block provides the user with a local link interface. The local link interface is a very simple, easy to use, memory-like interface. It also provides the user logic with a set of control signals so that the user logic can perform read and write requests, can provide addresses for the transactions, and check and can check the status of each transaction. So this is the logic that I should develop. This is the logic which is already available as a piece of IP from Xilinx. And the rest that you see here is the Axi world, which will be practically the Axi interconnect and then the Zinc PS. Now, in order to go a little bit deeper, I want to show you how this Axi burst IPIF works. In fact, as the one who is developing the user logic, I want to show you how I should drive the signals related to the local link interface of this IPIF. How I can ask this IPIF to initiate read and write transactions for me. So we first go through the read operation, and then we go through the write operation. So here, in three slides, I will show you the waveforms of the interface between the user logic and the Axi master burst IPIF when we want to perform a burst read operation. Every transaction that you want to do with the Axi master burst IPIF, it begins with a request. So the first step is always you send a request to the IPIF. If I want the IPIF 
to perform a read transaction for me from an address in the XI world, then I should enable the IP to bus master read request. If I want the IPIF to perform a write transaction for me, for example, to get a data from me and then to write this data to a specific address in the XI world, then I should send a write request. Well, the write request we will see later. So for now, we will focus on the read request. So we begin by sending a read request to the IPIF block. Along with this read request that you send to the IPIF block, you should also indicate the type of the transaction that you want the IPIF block perform for you. If you want, for example, to transfer only one chunk of data, or if you want to transfer a large number of data continuously one after another, or better to say, if you want to do a single beat operation or if you want to do a burst, then you indicate the address from which the read should happen. So the physical address in the system to which the actual read transaction should be initiated. And then you should indicate the byte enabled, which bytes are, are going to be read practically. And then you should indicate the length of the data which is going to be read. So here, we indicate in bytes how much data we want to read from this address. For example, I indicate an address with correct alignment. And then here, I indicate a number, for example, 256, as the amount of data that I want to read from this address. As you send the read request, your logic should wait until the IPIF responds with an acknowledge. So when I send read request, I enable the read request signal, I keep it active until I see the IPIF is responding back to me with an acknowledge, meaning that the IPIF has seen my read request. Only then you are allowed to, in fact, lower down the read request. From this point that the IPIF gives you the acknowledge, it will begin a read transaction on the XI bus. And it will provide you with the data obtained from the read transaction. When all of the data is provided to you and the read transaction is finished, the amount of data that requested is transferred, then the IPIF sends you another signal, which is the complete signal. And the complete signal indicates that the transaction is done completely and all of the data that you requested is transferred to you. So the sequence is the following. We send the re request signal. We wait for the acknowledge. The data will be transferred during these clock cycles. And then finally, we have the complete coming from the IPIF, indicating that this transaction is complete. Now let's look together what will happen here. In fact, between the acknowledge and between the complete, what will happen? How the signals will change? How the signals between my logic and the IPIF will change? how the signals on the XI interface will change. First, I will look at the signals between my IP and the IPIF. So, here I have the acknowledge, I have the complete. These are basically the signals that I was showing you in the previous slide, and here I have the signals which are between my logic and the IPIF. And these signals are responsible for transferring the data which the IPIF has read from the XI world to my logic. 
There are a set of important signals here that you should know. First, when a read operation begins, in fact, when you send a read request, what you should do is you should indicate to the IPIF that you are ready to accept the read data. And this you indicate with destination ready signal, IP to bus, master read, destination ready. This signal, which is an active low signal, when you pull it down, when your logic pulls, pulls it down, it indicates that your logic is ready to receive the read data. If you keep this signal up, nothing will happen. Because the IPIF sees that you are not ready to accept the data. So as you send the read request, you also need to bring down this signal to indicate to the IPIF that you are ready to receive the data. And now, as the acknowledge comes, and as the signal is low, the IPIF will initiate the actual read transaction. And it will, as soon as the data arrives at the IPIF, it will begin providing the data to you. When the IPIF wants to transfer the first piece of data to you, there is a signal called bus to IP, master read, a start of frame. Again, it's an active low signal. And it goes down to indicate that the IPIF is giving you the first piece of data that you are requesting. There is another signal, end of frame, which goes down along with the final piece of data that the Axi master will transfer to you. And then finally, there is another signal which is called bus to IP, master read, source ready. It's again an active low signal. And this signal stays low whenever the IPIF is providing you with a valid chunk of data. So with the first piece of data, a start of frame is low ready is low, source ready is low, better to say source ready is low, and destination ready is low. With other pieces of data, source ready is low, destination ready is low. And with the final piece of data, end of frame is low, source ready is low, destination ready is low. So whenever these conditions are happening, a data is being transferred from the IPIF to my logic. If any of these conditions, they are not there, they are not available, no data will be transferred. The data is not valid. Now, let's look together what happens, in fact, between the acknowledge and the complete on the Axi bus. These signals that we saw together were the signals between my logic and the IPIF. Now, let's have a look at the signals between the IPIF and the Axi world. Okay, here again we have the acknowledge, we have the complete, and the signals that I'm showing to you here, they are the signals on the Axi bus. So as you see, um, the Axi master bus IPIF for this specific case is triggering two Axi read requests. And then it receives, in fact, two pieces of data. So if I look at the R last signal, which is indicating kind of the end of the burst, I see it's active two times. So everything begin, begins with AR valid, as I have described to you in the previous videos. AR ready, as the response should be active at that specific clock cycle. 
Then we have another set of signals to indicate the address and the amount of data which should be transferred and similar information. And then we have, in fact, the read data. And then we have the R last indicating mm, this is the last piece of data which is being transferred for this transaction. Now, we switch to the write mode. And that is when I want to write some data to the IPIF, and I want to ask the IPIF to transfer this data to a specific address in the Axoi world for me. So let's see how a write request is being done. OK, a write request in the first step is very similar to the read request. It begins with sending master write request to the IPIF along with the address, along with if it's going to be a burst or a single chunk of data to be transferred, and along with the amount of data that I want the IPIF to write for me. And then we will wait for the acknowledge. And then as the acknowledge is arrived, I'm allowed to begin writing the data to the IPIF. And the IPIF will begin writing this data to the XI world. And as I transfer this amount of data to the IPIF, the complete signal will arrive. And that's the end of this write transaction. Now let's see together what happens between the logic that I develop and the IPIF so that I can write data to the IPIF. So here, again, in the top row, I have the signal acknowledge and complete. And here in the bottom row, I have the signals between my logic and the IPIF. And we want to see how should I drive these signals so that I can correctly transfer data to the IPIF. So as the acknowledge comes, you put your first piece of data that you want to transfer to the Axoi world on the data bus between you and the IPIF. Along with the first piece of data, you also activate the master write a start of frame signal to indicate to the IPIF that this is the first piece of data of this frame. Along with that signal, you should also bring down, pull down the source ready signal to indicate to the IPIF that this is a valid piece of data. As you do that and the IPIF sees your signals, it brings down its destination ready signal as the response to you. So the bus 2 IP, master write, destination ready, active low signal will come down after you enable the start of frame and you pull down the source ready signal. And as this signal comes down is zero. The source ready is zero. This start of frame is zero. The first piece of data will be transferred to the IPIF and consequently to the XI world. And then comes the other pieces of data. So in every clock cycle that the destination ready is zero and the source ready is zero, a piece of data will be transferred from you to IPIF. So your logic should be designed carefully so that it should not update the contents of the data bus between your logic and the IPIF unless it sees a data is transferred, the previous data is transferred successfully. If, for example, like here, the destination is not ready, no data is being transferred. So you should keep the contents of the data bus as it is until a successful transfer happens. 
Another very important point is the following. The destination ready signal comes after you tell the IPIF you have data to transfer. So in your logic, it's better that you first enable these two signals and then wait for this signal to arrive than first wait for this signal and then enable these two. So these are being done first and then this happens later. Finally, when you transfer all of the data, for the last piece of data that you want to write to the IPIF block, you lower down the end of frame signal to indicate for the IPIF block that this is the final chunk of data for this transaction. And then after that, the complete signal arrives, meaning that this transaction is over. Now let's see together what happens on the Axi uh, bus when we are transferring these signals between, in fact, the acknowledge and the complete. So here, again, I have the acknowledge. And then I have the complete. And this is the time between the acknowledge and the complete. And here I have put the signals between the IPIF and the XY wall. And here what we see is, in fact, two right transactions are being done, and two address requests, and then data, which is being written from the IPIF to specific address locations in the Axel world. OK, now we come back uh, to our image rotation algorithm, or our image rotator system. So I have an input image, and I want to kind of rotate this image and create another image. So what's the most basic approach that we can take to perform this task? Obviously. A rotation can be like this. I can develop a hardware accelerator, which is responsible for reading the pixels of the input image one after another. And then, based on the type of rotation that we want to do, it will put these pixels in suitable address locations in the destination buffer. So it calculates the address based on the type of the rotation that you want to do and puts the pixel on that specific address. So the very basic operation, we read one pixel, we calculate the address, we write the pixel. We read the next pixel, calculate the address, write the next pixel. This is, I think, the simplest logic that we can define. But you know, this logic has a problem. The problem is, Every time that I send a read request to the IPIF, and then the IPIF consequently sends forwards this read request to the XY world and waits for the response to come back, I am waiting for a very large number of clock cycles. For example, let's say, from when I send the read request until when I have the data, I should wait 20 clock cycles, and there is no response. So, for if I want to do the data transfer pixel by pixel, for each pixel I should wait 20 clock cycles. So for each pixel I should initiate a new read request and then I should wait 20 clock cycles so that the response comes and then again another probably 20 clock cycles so that I can perform the write and then I can continue this loop. So this latency will basically destroy our hardware accelerator. In fact, if we design the module like this, the hardware accelerator is useless because its speed will be much lower than the speed of the CPU. And what's the purpose behind a hardware accelerator? The purpose is you do processing tasks faster than the CPU. So what I should do, I should hide this latency or I should reduce this latency as much as possible. And one very basic approach that we can take to do this is instead of reading pixels one by one, I read groups of pixels. And then I write groups of pixels to the destination addresses. 
So I design my system so that I can read a series of pixels to buffer those series of pixels inside my hardware accelerator and then to write those pixels to correct locations in the destination addresses in the DRAM memory. With these bursts, practically in front of waiting, for example, 20 clock cycles for the data arrive, in front of this waiting for 20 clock cycles, you have, for example, transferred a very large number of pixels. You are using your bandwidth more efficiently. So the basic idea is we transfer pixels in groups. The bigger the group is, obviously, the better can be the performance. But you know, our FPGA resources, they are limited because when I read a group of pixels, I should save them somewhere. I cannot always stream them back. I should wait for all of the pixels to arrive. For example, imagine you are doing a 90 degree clockwise rotation. You should wait for the pixels to arrive so that you can transfer them. And then the amount of block memories that we have on the FPGA, they are limited. I don't have unlimited number of block memories. So I cannot, for example, read whatever amount of data and then transfer that data back to the DRAM. So there, there is this limitation. Now let's look at the common cases. For HD and UHD images with these resolutions, if we suppose that each pixel is represented with two bytes, then if I want to read a whole image into my buffer in the hardware accelerator and then write it back, I will need four megabytes of memory inside my hardware accelerator. Or for a UHD image, I need 16 megabytes of memory inside my hardware accelerator. While, for example, if I take a Zinc 7020 device, the total amount of block memories that I have there in the device is only 0.4 megabytes. So obviously I cannot read the whole image and then perform the rotation and then write it back. I should read it chunk by chunk. And this is what we do. So what we do is the following. We divide the image into equal size rectangles and then we perform our processing task for each rectangle separately. So we read one rectangle into our block memory inside the hardware accelerator. We perform the rotation task and we write it back to correct address in the destination buffer. Next, we read the next block we perform the rotation, we write it back to its correct address in the destination buffer. And now, for the size of this rectangular block, I should select it, considering the amount of block memories, that uh, amount of resources that I have on the FPGA, and also considering the efficiency that can, I can have in my Axi data transfers. So I want, I want this block to be not so small because I want to have bursts of data. Because with bursts, I can have performance. So this cannot be, for example, six, six pixels or 10 pixels. I want higher number of pixels so that I can have large bursts of data so that I can have an acceptable efficiency of the bus. And then on the other hand, this block should not be really big, because if it is really big, then I need a lot of block memories, and I don't have really a lot of block memories inside my device. So this is kind of decision that the designer should make. But for our case, that we want to rotate a HD or UHD image, considering the fact that the dimensions of the HD and UHD images, they are all in fact, multiple of 120. I select a block for processing, a block of size 120 by 120 pixels. So every time I read a block of 120 by 120 pixels from the DRAM memory, 
I store it on my local block memories, and then I write it back in a correct, in fact, order to the destination DRAM memory. So here are some basic calculations. First, for our Axi master best IP, we use a data bus of 64 bits. If each pixel is represented by a 16-bit number, at every clock cycle, I'm transferring four pixels. Each burst in my system will read 120 pixels. This means that, in fact, in each transaction, in each request, read request or write request that I sent to the IPIF, I'm transferring 240 bytes of data. This means I'm performing bursts of length of 30, which is a kind of acceptable burst length. So it's not really pushing the bandwidth of uh, the Axi bus to its maximum, but at the same time, it reaches an acceptable, acceptable uh, bus efficiency. For the IPIF that we have, my IPIF supports tra performing transactions of up to one megabyte. So 240 bytes is nothing. It's very easy for the Axi IPIF to handle. And then our Axi subsystem, in fact, of the Zinc device, supports bursts up to lengths of 256. And a burst of 30 is, again, a burst length which is really suitable for this system. So I design my logic to ask the IPIF to perform bursts of length 30 to transfer 240 bytes every time, and practically to read 120 pixels each time. And the logic that I design, I read blocks of 120 by 120 pixels. I store them in my local block memories. And then I read them back in a suitable order so that I can create the required rotation effect. Now, here is a very simple representation of top level of the module that I'm going to create. My top level has an Axi slave block. We have talked about it before. Has the Axi master best IPIF. And then it has a third module that I'm going to develop. And this is the module which is responsible for receiving the configuration from the slave interface. And then this is the module which is responsible for talking to the Axi master best. And then finally, the top level will contain an ILA core so that at the time of operation on the real hardware, I can monitor the actual signals. And if there is any fault in my design, I can find the fault and I can fix it. So the most challenging task of this design is to design this block so that it can talk correctly to the Axel master. It can ask for transfers of burst lengths of 30, 240 bytes. It can generate addresses correctly. And it can store and retrieve the data correctly. Here is a very simple block diagram of the architecture that I intend to implement for my main module, the module that will talk to Axi slave and Axi master block. It contains four block memories and 64 bits of data arrives from the IPIF, four pixels. And practically, I store um, each pixel in one of these block memories. So this bit is 16 bits. It's not eight. It's 16 bits. Each pixel is here in one of these block memories. And this is when I'm reading one block of 120 by 120. 
And at the time of writing back the block, I will read from these block memories. And then I will write back the pixels to the actual world. As you see, I use four block memories in parallel because sometimes when, for example, I'm doing a 90 degree rotation, I need to read four pixels just from one block memory. And some other times, for example, when I'm doing a flip operation, I need to read only one pixel from each block memory. So based on the type of, in fact, rotation that you are doing, the access pattern, the read and write access pattern to the, these block memories will change so that we can have the maximum possible efficient performance always. I want to be able to, in every clock cycle, to receive four pixels at the time of reading the image from the DRAM memory. And then I want to be able, at every clock cycle, to transfer four pixels at the time of transferring back the rotated block. And I want to be able to perform this task for all of the rotation types that I talked about it. Clockwise, counterclockwise rotation, flip operations, and copy. And this is why I use four, in fact, parallel block memories with an input width of 16 bits and an output width of 64 bits. This allows me to, if I need, just read one pixel from each block memory, or if I need to read four pixels just from one block memory. Then, my module has a kind of main FSM. The main FSM is responsible for controlling the overall operation of this module. Overall, it decides what should happen right now. If we should read one block, or we should write one block. So this is a kind of overall controller. And then there is another FSM, which is responsible for generating suitable control signals to the Axi master IPIF. So this guy is responsible for overall operation of the module. This FSM is responsible for generating correct sequence of signals for the Axi master IPIF. Then I have one write address generator and one read address generator. These guys are, at the time of reading a block from DRAM, this guy is responsible for producing correct write addresses for the block memories. And at the time of writing back a block to the DRAM, this guy is responsible for producing correct addresses to perform reads. And then I have this module, select read data, which is connected to the read data bus of all of these for dual port block memories. And this guy is responsible for selecting the correct pixel based on the rotation task that you want to do. And now, the very important point is that this architecture is not simple. When I implement it in the RTL, it's kind of complicated. So before really implementing anything on the real hardware, before I want to do uh, any test on the Z board or Zinc or any device, I should perform a simulation. I should validate my design and make sure that the design is working correctly in the simulation. Or as far as I, I can, I should make sure that this design is working correctly in the simulation. And then I can go ahead with practical implementation on the hardware. It will be a very big mistake if you design your controller logic and without validating your design in func uh, with functional simulation, you'd go directly ahead with implementation on the FPGA. Yes, it's true that you can have a block lock ILA and the block lock ILA will allow you to monitor the signals on the real hardware but when the complexity of your module gets high, this ILA, ILA block will never help you at all to find complicated bugs that your module can have. So after I realized the RTL for this block, the next step is I should make sure I can simulate the operation of this block and, make, and 
find the possible bugs that my hardware has and fix them as much as I can. And then I can go for real implementation. So here is the point. I want to functionally simulate the operation of this whole architecture. And this whole architecture is really big. It contains the Zinc PS. It contains Axoi subsystem. Then it contains these um, Axoi RPIF and then the Axoi slave. And then it contains my logic. So the guy who is uh, really under test, who is the one that I'm interested to validate its correct operation is this guy. But when I want to do a complete functional simulation, I need models for all of these guys. So a valid functional simulation needs a model for the Zinc PS, model for Axel subsystem, models for, in fact, both of these guys, Axel Master Best and Axel Slave. But one fact that we know is that these pieces of logic, they are already very well tested and we are sure that all of these pieces of logic they work fine and the one who is under question is the logic that we have developed okay how do i perform a functional simulation how do i model these pieces of logic that i have here i in the first step i don't have any model for them by default so I should look for models for Zinc PS, for models for, in fact, the bus, the Axoi bus. And then I should add those models to my simulation environment so that I can, in fact, really verify, validate the correct operation of this piece of IP that I have developed. There exist models for the Zinc PS subsystem. There exist models for, in fact, Axoi subsystem. For example, Cadence has developed a complete virtual environment that models the behavior of the Zinc PS completely. So that can be provided and then it will be added. It, will, it can be, in fact, joined to your simulation environment and then you can really have a mo correct model for the Zinc PS. Or there are bus functional models that Xilinx provides for the Axoi subsystem. So these bus functional models you can prepare and then they kind of model the behavior of an Axoi bus with a set of read and write operations that you can define. So for every piece of logic that I have here, there exist models. But the point is these models, they're not free. Or at the first step, they are not free. So for a normal designer, which is doing a kind of maybe hobby task or near hobby task, is not that serious, there's no big money there, then these models may, may not be available. So what I do to simulate this logic is the following. I know that the Zinc PS works fine. The Axoi subsystem, they work fine. I know that the Axoi Master Best IPIF is, ten, is used by millions of people. It works fine. So the point is that I want to check the operation of my own module. And what I do, I create models for the Axoi Slave and Axoi Master Plug. So I create simple models for the Axoi Slave Plug and I create another simple model for the Axoi Master Burst. And I use my experience, the experience that I have had with working with Axoi, I have seen the signals, how they change, what are the limitations, what are the constraints. I use my experience to create this model. <coughs> I use my experience to create this model and make it as realistic and as complete as possible. At the end, this will never replace a bus functional model, or this subsystem will never replace the Zinc virtual environment that Cadence is providing. But even if you create a very simple model for the Axel Master Burst IPIF, and a very simple model 
for Axel slave plug, even a very simple model, can really help you to verify the operation of your own logic and to find the bugs inside your design to a very good extent. So what I do, I look at the, at the signals that Xilinx is providing for its Axel Master Burst IPIF. I look at the specification and I create my own model here. And at the time of simulation, instead of the Axon Master Burst IPIF of Xilinx, I use this model. And I perform my simulation and I make sure that this whole set is working correctly. And as I made sure, I take my block, I put it into the real design, I add the ILA, and then I try it on the real Z Zinc dev device. So, the Axel Master Burst IPIF model that I have developed simulates the transactions between the Axel Master Burst IPIF and the user logic in, to some extent. And then, I have made it capable of practically reading an image, providing that image to my logic as the image which is coming from the DRAM, and then receiving the data from my logic and writing it back to the image. And then what I do for validating my design, I look at this input image, I look at the output image, and I ex expect to see correct output images based on the input image. So, this way, I can make sure at least the basic functionality of this module is correct. It will not be a 100% accurate validation of the design, but with no budget, at least you are able to kind of make sure this is working fine. And then on the real hardware, the ILA can really help you to find small bugs and to fix them. So this is what we are going to do in the next session. We create this environment. I show you first how this block is designed, how these guys are connected to each other. And then after we went through the architecture, we begin the simulation. I show you how I provide these files, what I have created here. And then I show you some results for the simulation. And th after that, we made sure that the simulation is working fine. We go ahead and try our design on the real Zinc device.